If you've come this far in the course, then you've already drawn a lot of Bayesian owls. Uh, this is just an analogy, of course. I'm not asking you to draw any real owls, uh, but the analyses we've produced in this course involve a lot of steps, just like real drawings of owls. There's a foundation that's laid down that eventually vanishes underneath the later detail. And it's also true that there's no separating the technical aspects of the drawing, the almost algorithmic steps by which uh, a general design is replaced by detail from the artistic inspiration, that is, the imagination of what this all will look like in the end, the estimate, what we're trying to get in the first place. In these later lectures in the second half of the course, I think you feel this blending very strongly, that it's extremely technical material, uh, but it's also true that the drawings are much more satisfying once they're done because they're very effective, mature, scientific projects that describe whole samples and get us what we're after. In this lecture, I want to talk about another way to expand the varying effects strategy. And in this case, we're going to think about uh, lots of technical and scientific things. I want to start by reminding you of the scientific goal, though, what the owl is supposed to look like at the end, what we're trying to do in the first place. And I want to do this because varying effects are very technical in their details. To uh, express them and program them and interpret them correctly requires lots of technical skill. You can acquire that technical skill through instruction and practice, but it's important that you know why you're doing it. So let's focus on that a bit. To remind you, the varying effect strategy is to use unmeasured features of the clusters in your data. And these clusters are things like departments or individuals or stories. Uh, these clusters have unmeasured features and these unmeasured features leave an imprint on the data. And we can measure these unmeasured features through the use of repeat observations on each cluster. And we can make better estimates uh, through the use of partial pooling at the same time. And there are two ways to think about why this is such a great thing, a great technology as part of our scientific analysis skills. The first is the purely predictive perspective. Uh, clusters are an important source of uh, sorry, the, the unmeasured features in the data are an important source of cluster level variation. That is, uh, things like departments or countries or individuals introduce variation in the data uh, through things that we haven't measured. Uh, but there's a way statistically to actually take that variation out so that we can see better uh, the predictive importance of other aspects. And this will like, uh, allow us to make better predictions uh, for future samples. Uh, simultaneously, we get regularized estimates through the use of partial pooling, and that'll give us better predictions out of sample. The second is the purely causal perspective. The causal perspective, as I keep saying, is a certain kind of predictive perspective. It's about being able to predict the consequences of interventions. And from this perspective, it's important that we statistically adjust for competing causes because that gives us better, more precise estimates of the causes of interest. And it's even more important that we do something about unobserved confounds. And clusters sometimes are unobserved confounds. Let me give you some examples. Uh, so think back to the first half of the course when I introduced confounding through this example of marriage, agent marriage, and divorce. And in this example, it turned out that um, agent marriage appears to be the strong driver of divorce rate in North America, not the marriage rate M. Uh, but of course, there are lots of confounds in systems like this. Uh, that is, g uh, regional cultural differences between parts of the United States that are actually causing differences in agent marriage and possibly also differences in divorce rate. So the association between agent marriage and divorce that we found may not be an accurate measure of the causal force of agent marriage on divorce through these regional issues. And so if we were to revisit that analysis, we might want to consider 
uh, regional, geographical, and historical cultural relationships between the different states that may also account for associations between age of marriage and divorce. Another example, when I introduced um, collider bias, I used this example of uh, educational achievement of grandparents, parents, and children. <clears throat> And I introduced an explicit confound of neighborhood. That is that parents and their children share uh, exposures from their neighborhood uh, that grandparents don't share with them. And this could generate more similarity between parents and their children in their educational outcomes or their incomes or any number of other things that are not shared with grandparents. If we could use uh, the neighborhood's identity and have repeat observations on neighborhood, it, through a varying effect strategy, it's possible to get some statistical control on such confounds, even though we don't know what it is about neighborhoods that are influencing parents and their children and making them more similar. Another example, remember the trolley problem. Uh, this was one of the most complicated DAGs that I've used so far in this course, uh, but the relevant bits I want to draw your attention to are the um, participation nodes at the very bottom. Uh, in, an, in this example, I've made it a bit simpler. I've made it only so education E is driving participation in the sample, in the survey. Remember, this was a survey, voluntary online survey. Um, by itself like that, that's not a confound. If the sample is selected on education, uh, you just need to post stratify to some other educational distribution. But no confound is necessarily introduced because there's no uh, backdoor pass or colliders created by the DAG on the screen, just by conditioning on, on P, on participation. However, you look at the top, at the individual U that I've drawn, those are the individual identities. We have many repeat observations. I think it's 30 for every individual in the sample. What if there are aspects of the individuals we haven't measured, like their personalities or their cultural backgrounds or their religious backgrounds that influence both their responses to the trolley problems, which are represented by R at the center of this graph, and participation in the sample? So imagine, for example, that individuals who have a particularly strong moral psychology are more likely to participate in such a study that is about moral psychology and will have different responses from a typical person in the population. In that case, conditioning on participation does create a confound through the individual features that we haven't measured. But if we can use repeat observations on individuals through a varying effect strategy, we can get some statistical control on such a confound. One more example. Uh, Long-standing question in political science and international relations is the extent to which different forms of government um, are more or less likely to lead countries to go to war. So in this DAG, I'm asking you to consider some particular pair of countries, a dyad, uh, numbers one and two, and we have their governmental forms at different periods of time, G1 and G2, and then in the middle is the outcome, W for war, uh, whether they're at peace or at war. Uh, we're interested in the relationships between the forms of government and the chances that pairs of countries go to war with one another. This is long-standing hypothesis that democracies don't go to war with one another. Democracies only go to war with non-democracies. Um, there are a number of potential confounds represented here by X uh, or ex other explanatory variables. And the Xs could be geography or any number of other things uh, that may also lead um, countries to go to war. In these cases, there are likely to be lots of unmeasured confounds that are associated with the political boundaries of the countries. You're represented just by these nodes for nation in each case. And it isn't that the nation itself is causal, but rather that there are historical and cultural features associated with nation states that also influence their government and the chances they go to war and therefore are a statistical confound in the orthodox sense. If we have repeat observations on each nation, however, there's some hope that we can use a varying effect strategy to get some statistical control on those confounds. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's the causal perspective on varying effects as a useful tool, one of the really essential tools in our causal inference toolbox. Um, uh, there's a big advantage over an alternative and very similar approach that's often used for the same reasons. It's called the fixed effect approach. Uh, the, the fixed effect approach is essentially, from a, a statistical perspective, varying effects in which we set the standard deviation of those varying effects to infinity. We fix it at infinity. We don't try to learn it from the sample. And what this does is it results in no pooling across the clusters. So it results in treating every department or every uh, cafe or every nation as if it contains no information about the other nations in the sample. Uh, so there's no pooling, no partial pooling. The fixed effect approach can be very effective, but it has some serious drawbacks. Uh, in particular, it, it does not allow you to include other cluster level causes. So that is uh, uh, aspects of each cluster, which are time invariant across the repeat observations, um, but it may also be important objects of study. Uh, so for example, um, in, this, in this example on the right that I'm repeating of uh, whether democracies go to war with one another, um, if there are aspects of the X's like geography, which are invariant over the time series of interest, because geography doesn't change very rapidly, with a fixed effect approach, you can't include such predictors because the fixed effects soak up everything that is about each nation. Uh, with the varying effects approach, you can include it all. There are no guarantees, of course, uh, but don't panic. As always, the right thing to do is make a generative model first and draw the Bayesian owl. Uh, figure out if it's possible with the data at hand and the design you plan to get the inference you want. Okay, in the previous lecture, I introduced this distinction in the varying effects models between clusters and features. So clusters are entities in the sample, things like tanks of tadpoles, uh, stories in the trolley problems, individuals uh, or departments. Um, uh, each cluster has repeat observations in the data. Uh, and then there are features. Features are things about the clusters uh, which we want to measure or which may be causes uh, of something we want to measure. Uh, so like uh, survival rates could vary by tanks, uh, the treatment effects can vary by story, um, responses can vary by individuals, and emissions rates and biases can vary by departments. In the previous lecture, I focused on the clusters. How do we add more clusters to a model? Because often in a realistic scientific problem, there are a number of different clusters at different levels of hierarchy in the population that are present in the same sample. But now we're gonna look at features uh, and show you how to do features as well in combination with more clusters. So that what results here is adding features means adding more parameters um, but not more population priors, simply more dimensions in each population prior. So let's talk about what that means. We're committed to having one prior distribution for each cluster because we're thinking there's one statistical population. It doesn't have to be a real empirical population, just a statistical population of the clusters we're talking about, we're, we're sampling from. And they can be treatments, they can be individuals, they can be tanks, they can be departments. Um, it'll help if we, we walk our way up in complexity here. So when there's only one feature for the cluster of interest, uh, then the population prior we assign is just a one dimensional distribution. And this is what we did with the tadpoles in the very first varying effects example. Uh, this alpha J is a normal distribution with some mean alpha bar and some standard deviation sigma. It's a one dimensional distribution because what, when we sample from it, once we get one number, just one alpha j, just one log odds of mortality for the tadpoles, for example. What happens when we have two features uh, per cluster? Then we have a two-dimensional um, population distribution, and now when we sample from that distribution, we get two numbers. So in the example I've, I've put here, we get an alpha and a beta. I haven't said what these alphas and betas are, but they're just two features. Uh, of each cluster in the population. And the most convenient way to do this is to use a multivariate normal, which is just a normal distribution, uh, 
more than one normal distribution um, joined together with some covariance uh, among the different dimensions. And so a multivariate normal is parameterized by now a list of means, a vector of means, uh, here alpha bar and beta bar for the two-dimensional, and then some covariance matrix, often written as sigma. Uh, the multivariate normal is incredibly useful and, and computationally very flexible. We can extend it to very large numbers of dimensions so that, such that for some number n of features, where n could be 10, 20, 30, um, we use an n-dimensional distribution. And every time we sample from this multivariate normal, this n-dimensional multivariate normal, we get n numbers. And those n numbers are a list of features that have some pattern of covariation among them, some correlation structure uh, within each entity, within each cluster, within each department, within each tank, within each story, within each individual. This strategy works very well, it, conceptually and computationally, with a little bit of practice. The hard part for these models is learning the associations. It's not the dimensionality. Scaling up in dimensions is easy. Learning the associations is hard. Let's think about learning the associations just conceptually first, and then we'll turn to the code. So put the code out of your mind, and let's just think in terms of the pictures of what comes out of these models. <clears throat> what I'm showing on the slide here is um, the population distribution of the average logs on, uh, log odds of admission on the horizontal axis uh, for applications from men, and on the vertical, the average difference between applications from women and men uh, for the UC Berkeley admissions data. Um, this is a hypothetical population, just a prior right now, and you're looking down on it from the top. This is a Gaussian distribution. So it's like a hill where it's taller in the middle there and then gets flatter as we move out into the outer rings. Um, there's no correlation structure in this. It's just round all around. It's not tilted in any way. So a priori, there's no association between departments that have a good chance of admitting applications from uh, men and have uh, also a good chance of admitting applications from women or have some bias. Uh, the vertical axis here represents some bias, some difference in the admissions rates between men and women. Now let's think about a series of departments that we'll get data from. And we're going to use the varying effects model. This is like the coffee golem example from a couple of lectures back. Um, but now with applications, graduate school applications, as our, as our example. And we think about a first department, and also before we've seen any data from it, similarly, uh, we use the population distribution to inform our prior expectations of it. What I've done on this graph is I've, I've drawn the um, posterior distribution for each department using the red uh, uh, here. And then I've drawn the blue cross to indicate the mean from the population distribution, just the mean for the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. And we're going to use that uh, as this animates so that you can understand how these models learn. Um, we're going to look at five different departments simultaneously. Now, don't worry, we're going to update them one at a time. And I want to show you, like with the coffee golem example, how this kind of model learns uh, a model with memory. <clears throat> The first thing we do is we look at the whole pile of applications from men for department one. And what this does is it updates the posterior distribution for department one along the horizontal axis. So in gray now on each of these graphs, I'm showing you the, the posterior distribution uh, from the previous step. In other words, I'm showing you the prior in each place in gray. I'll say that again. I'm showing the prior for each department and from the population in gray. So this makes it easier to see what has changed when we inspect applications from any particular department. So first thing to notice, in department one, uh, most of the movement from the prior has been along the horizontal axis. There's been a contraction of variation on the horizontal axis because we've gotten a lot of information about the admissions rate of applications from men. Um, we haven't learned anything yet, uh, in particular, about, about the vertical axis, about the difference in application rate between men and women, because we haven't looked at that stack yet. We're going to do that next. But before we do that, 
look at the other departments and you'll see that they've moved as well even though we have no data for them yet. We haven't looked at any applications for the other departments yet. They've moved as well because the population distribution has moved. We've just looked at, uh, I think it's 100 uh, applications from department one, only from men, and this has shifted the population distribution, the blue distribution in the upper left to the right. And this has had an effect on the prior for all of the departments. This is the varying effects feature that we've seen in the two previous lectures. It's the standard effect. Now we look at the stack of applications from women for department one, and we update that as well. Uh, it turns out that in this particular department, women are advantaged. Um, and now, uh, uh, so it's above the mean. But I want you to see, of course, department one's, one's posterior is now strongly contracted in both directions. But look at the population of departments in the upper left, the blue rings. You'll see that it's starting to tilt uh, to the right. And that indicates some correlation uh, between the values uh, at the department level between uh, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. That is to say, um, departments that have large values of, of A, that is the parameter on the horizontal axis, will also have larger values of B. Uh, but this is one department so far, so it's not, a very, it's not very confident. Um, and you'll see that the other departments have likewise uh, tilted a bit. Let's look at department two now. So in department two, we look at just the applications for men, and it's right on the population average. It happens to turn out by chance. Um, we haven't seen the applications for women yet, but the best guess is since this department is average for A, it'll be average for B. And that's why it's right there on the middle of the cross. And now we update, oh, and it turns out it's also average for B and we've got this little contraction. Uh, let's look at department three. So now we look at applications for men for department three. Um, it's a little below average. I say that because it's to the left of the vertical blue line. Remember the vertical blue line shows the population average across departments for the horizontal axis variable for A, which is the log odds of admitting a male applicant. Um, and now we update for women, and it's a little bit below. So now uh, the model has seen, or the golem has seen, a department both with a higher than average um, horizontal axis value and a higher than average uh, vertical axis value, a higher than average A and a higher than average B, and a department with a lower than average A and a lower than average B. And so if you look at the population distribution in the upper left now, the correlation has gotten more confident. It's tilting more. Uh, the, the model now thinks that there's some correlation across departments between A and B. Let's see if that pans out and what this does to the learning and the anticipation that the model has. So now department four, we have um, from just the applications for men, uh, a value that's um, uh, at minus one approximately on the log odd scale. And notice that even though for department four, we haven't seen any applications, or the model hasn't seen any applications from women yet, it expects, uh, the, it, ex it expects the distribution to be less than the average. That is the center of the red distribution is below the horizontal blue line. And that comes from the correlation in the upper left, the correlation across departments between A and B. And now we update. And the model's uh, anticipation is confirmed. Um, the departments with lower A's also have lower B's. Now it's quite confident there's some correlation. Uh, let's see what happens with department five. Before we look at department five's data, you see that it already expects a correlation. There's a tilt to this Gaussian hill. Um, we look at department five's male applications, far below average, the lowest we've seen yet. And you'll see before we even look at the applications for women, uh, the model expects the B values to be below the population mean, to be below the horizontal blue line. And then we look and we find it that way. This is what um, uh, Bayesian updating with varying effects looks like in a multidimensional varying effects model in which the model is not only learning and partially pooling um, for more than one feature at the same time. The features here are the horizontal and vertical axes of these graphs, that is, uh, the log odds of admission for applications for men, and then the difference uh, in log odds of admission between applications for women and men on the vertical axis. 
Uh, it's not just estimating those two things and doing partial pooling within each, but it's estimating the correlation between them. And what this lets it do is it lets, us, lets it pass information from one to the next, just as to back up one step, before in department five, the model saw the applications for women, it was already able to accurately predict that the, for this department, the probability that, that the value of B would be below the mean. And that's the predictive and causal inference value of practicing varying effects in multiple dimensions while simultaneously learning the correlations between the features. It'll help a lot if we look at this in the context of a real data analysis example so that we can see how to really draw the owl, how to actually program it. And to make this a little more approachable, I appreciate that this is complicated material. Um, let's revisit the prosocial chimpanzees example from the previous lecture. So just to very quickly remind you, this is an experiment, uh, seven different chimpanzees, six experimental blocks, around 500 trials total, and four treatments. And we're interested in the causal effect of these treatments on the chimpanzees' behavior. Um, and in the previous lecture, what I showed you is uh, most of the variation in these data comes from the handedness preferences uh, of the individual chimpanzees and very little comes from the treatments and that's what we were able to estimate with a sort of the simplest possible varying effects approach um, now let's think about uh, taking this actor variation and allowing the actors responses not to just be some average like they are in this graph but also to vary by treatment that is each actor might have a handedness preference, but it might not express that handedness preference in all treatments equally. The data are here to answer that question, so let's see how to statistically program it. So just to quickly remind you, I'll show you again the DAG for this experiment, just a very simplified structural diagram. We don't anticipate any confounding, but we do have competing causes like block and actor that may moderate the treatment effects and that's something we'd like to estimate as well. Uh, so this is going to be a Bernoulli model with the outcome P, which is whether the uh, individual chimpanzee pulled the left lever. And we have a generalized linear model here on the log odd scale. Um, and there's four terms in it. Uh, but let me zoom in on this a bit just so I can explain it. The, this is not unfamiliar material to you, but it's good to be clear at the start. Um, so the first term here, the alpha bar, this is the mean for each actor. So you see I've subset it by A of I. This is uh, the actor on the ith observation, uh, the ith lever pull. This is going to be a varying effect. It will be partially pulled across actors. This is what we did in the previous lecture. Then next to it, we're going to have um, the possibility that each actor has a unique offset for each treatment, and this is a way to measure the extent to which uh, uh, the treatments affect the handedness preference in different ways. They can either turn it off, they could exaggerate it, and so on. Then we have beta bar. Uh, this is the mean for each block. Different blocks could have different mean rates of pulling the left lever for reasons unknown. Uh, we didn't look at a term like this before. Um, but for symmetry, I'm going to add it in here so that it looks like the actor effects. And then uh, we have uh, block offsets for each treatment. That is, the treatments could have been more or less effective in the different experimental blocks. And this is very much similar to what we did in, in the previous lecture. Um, but now we're going to have separate variances uh, for each of the treatments, which we didn't do before. So how do we specify the multivariate normal prior, that is the multidimensional prior? Uh, so there are four treatments. And so when we think about the alpha sub j's, um, uh, which are uh, these um, offsets for each treatment, alpha sub j should be a list of four numbers because there are four treatments where j is an actor uh, from one to seven. And so this is a four dimensional multivariate normal and you'll see the way I've written it here. There's a mean that uh, is just four zeros because we're centering this on the alpha bar values. <clears throat> and then I'm parameterizing it with a correlation matrix represented there by the capital R, um, R sub A for actor, and a vector of standard deviations, S sub A. 
That is, there's a separate variance for each treatment within the actors. And then the correlation matrix R gives us a way to estimate, to learn the correlation structure within actors across the treatments. Uh, so for example, if some particular actor tends to pull the lever more in treatment one, they may pull it more in treatment two. Similarly for the blocks, uh, it looks very similar in expression, but now it's for the blocks from one to six, six experimental blocks. And for each one, we need to draw from a four dimensional normal distribution to get the effect of each block one through six in each of the four treatments. And again, we wanna model the correlations through R sub B and allow each treatment to have its own variation, its own amount of variation, its own standard deviation in the vector S sub B. Okay, here's the rest of the model. We also need um, uh, the conventional one-dimensional uh, varying effect distributions, varying effect priors for the alpha bar and beta bar um, vectors, which I show you here. This is just like the stuff we did in the previous lecture, just the simple one-dimensional ones, uh, nothing new there. Um, and then the priors at the bottom, uh, all of the scale parameters in this model, whether they're uh, in the vectors uh, capital S sub A or capital S sub B, or in the scale variables for alpha bar and beta bar, which I've represented here with tau, just so I could use a different letter. Hopefully that's less confusing. Um, I'm going to give them an exponential distribution with a rate of one. Uh, and then at the very bottom of this, we have the two correlation matrices, R sub A and R sub B, and we're assigning them this um, prior distribution, LKJ core. Uh, the LKJ correlation distribution is a prior distribution. It's a distribution for correlation matrices. Uh, correlation matrices are highly structured things, so you can't just give them any old distribution you want. And you certainly can't just assign every element of the matrix its own distribution uh, because there are constraints on the, the relationships among the different elements of a correlation matrix, right? Um, I say a lot more about this distribution in the book. I'm not going to say more about it in this lecture just for the sake of time. So you really should look at the book and see what it does. Uh, it's a very nice family of distributions for sampling random correlation matrices and doing regularization on correlation matrices. <clears throat> okay, I appreciate that this is a quite terrifying and monstrous thing that we have conjured. Uh, this is like one of the old ones. Um, can we survive a model like this? Yes. Uh, it's long and it has lots of moving parts and parameters, but fundamentally it's no different than the first model we fit in the course. It's still just an expression of the relationships among the variables and parameters um, that allows us to count all the ways the sample could arise given the assumptions. And as long as we're careful and we build it up in steps, we maintain control and we will not be devoured. So let's take a trip through the code, and I want to show you the symmetry between the code on the left and the uh, statistical model on the right, so you can see how the code reflects the assumptions of the model. So of course, first, um, we have the Bernoulli outcome and uh, the generalized linear model. Uh, I hope there are no surprises here. And uh, now the code for the adaptive priors. So to set up the multivariate normal priors, you use the multinormal distribution. And uh, the way we're conceptualizing this is that um, A is uh, a matrix, but I've represented it instead as a list of vectors. I'll say that again. A is a matrix, uh, but I'm representing it here as a list of vectors. So the idea is that there are four treatments, and for each actor A, we need to sample values from the multinormal for each of those treatments. So for each actor A, we have a vector of four numbers. And so that's what this code means. When you read vector of length four, colon A uh, for each actor, that means for each actor, there's a vector of length four that has its distribution as a multinormal with means of zero, a correlation matrix of rho A, those, those capital R's on the previous slides are the Greek letter rho, and some uh, vector of length four of standard deviations, sigma a. <clears throat> the
the same for uh, B, for the betas, uh, but with uh, its own correlation matrix and vector standard deviations. And then the A bar and B bar, you've seen this before. These are um, ordinary one-dimensional um, partial pooling priors. Uh, but I'm using tau as a new symbol so that you can uh, quickly tell them apart, not get too confused. Finally, we have all the fixed priors, the non-adaptive priors, the ones that don't perform partial pooling, that don't have parameters inside them um, for the taus, the sigmas, and then the correlation matrices, and you see those LKJ core distributions there again. Okay, you can run this model, uh, and what you'll see is that the chains don't run perfectly. Uh, they have some problems. Uh, what you're looking at here is is the output of a, a utility function that I use for myself. It's part of the rethinking package, but it's not documented because it's just a, a thing I use um, in my own work all the time. But I'm sharing it with you here uh, just to show you the output, which is not particularly pretty. This function is called dashboard. And if you pass it a fit stand model, what it'll do is it'll produce this display. And in the upper left, we want to look there, is a plot of the number of effective samples for each parameter in the model. Each point is a parameter against the R hat for that parameter. And uh, what you see is that we have some parameters on the left which are not looking good. They have R hats. Um, good bit above one, up to 1.04, and a number of them have very low numbers of effective samples. That vertical red line on the left represents 10% of the samples drawn, the post warm up samples drawn, and that's a good ballpark for big trouble uh, in a Markov chain. It's just a, it's just a ballpark, it's not a test. Uh, just use it as a visual reference. Um, You'll see also we have 37 divergent transitions, uh, so check yourself. Um, divergent transitions aren't always doom. Remember, they're just rejected proposals, and other Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms reject a lot of proposals. We get alarmed about them with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo because often it won't reject any. Uh, so when it does start rejecting things, that's a hint that something's up and maybe um, we're getting biased samples. There are parts of the distribution, the posterior distribution, that we're not exploring well. Uh, then you can see the, the trank plot of the log probability does not look good either. Uh, for long stretches, um, one of the chains there, the yellow one, is above or below the others, um, and the effective sample size is not great either. So we can fix this, um, but we're going to do that after the break. Um, take a break, uh, and before you come back, I really strongly encourage you to review quickly the first half of this lecture again. Um, there's a lot of conceptual stuff that's new, and there's a lot of technical stuff that's new. And I promise you, you don't have to understand it all to keep moving forward. You really don't. Um, but you should understand a bit of it uh, before you press on. So take your break, and when you come back, I will be here. Okay, welcome back. To fix the model that was having so much trouble before the break, we need to revisit this lesson from the previous lecture of centered versus non-centered distributions. So to refresh your memory, I had introduced this example of the devil's funnel. Uh, and this is a simple two-dimensional uh, distribution we'd like to sample from, but it has a region of really horrible curvature and as the virtual skateboarder wanders into that narrow funnel, the simulation has a lot of trouble following that steep curvature. Uh, there are a number of things we can do to fix this. We can use smaller step sizes, for example, but the most effective thing is to reparameterize the model. And that means to factor the parameters, in this case V, out of the distributions for the other parameter uh, and then have a nice Gaussian bowl again, as you see on the right. Um, and we get back to the di target distribution that we really want by deterministically expressing X here in this example in terms of the other two parameters. We can do this trick um, 
uh, for all kinds of varying effect models. Uh, varying effect models often have distributions of this shape with terrible funnels in them. Again, to re just refresh your memory, we saw the centered model in the previous lecture. Uh, this is for the chimpanzees where we have um, the distribution for the actors. Alpha J is normal with a mean alpha bar and some standard deviation sigma. And then for the blocks as well, it's centered. It's centered because it has a parameter inside the distribution. The sigma B is inside the normal. And then the non-centered version factors all of the parameters out of the priors. Um, it replaces the priors on alpha and beta with priors on Z sub alpha and Z sub beta. These are uh, just normal 0, 1 priors because they're z-scores. That's why I call them z. Uh, and then we recompute uh, the alpha and beta to be mathematically the same as in the centered version by multiplying the z-scores by the standard deviations for each type of effect, for each cluster type, whether it's actors or blocks. And that's what the logit line on the right looks like. Okay, good enough. Uh, oh, I should have shown you this. Yes, the Z's uh, are, are reappear uh, in the linear model. We can do this strategy with multidimensional prior distributions as well. Conceptually, though, it's a bit odd. Uh, so to remind you, here's the, here's the model we would like to fit um, uh, today for uh, 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 the chimpanzees, uh, the one we looked at uh, prior to the break. And, and sample data from. How can we factor uh, the R and the S, that is the correlation matrices and the vectors of standard deviations, out of these distributions? How do you factor a matrix out of a distribution and then put it back into a linear model, that is the logit line? Uh, that's just a sum of terms. How can I put a matrix in there? That is a question we're going to answer over the next series of slides. And I'm going to take my time and uh, but before I get to the, uh, the meat of it, let me emphasize again this basic issue about this business is that there's really no separating uh, arriving at the scientific estimate that is achieving your scientific goals from the technical aspects like expressing the model correctly and getting the machine to run right. If you're going to draw the owl, you have to do it in the right steps. And in the beginning, it doesn't look like an owl, but that doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. And there are certainly aspects of drawing the owl which are tedious and boring and not as satisfying as looking at the finished product. And that's, well, that's what science is like too. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to walk you through it, uh, all the steps of drawing this owl. And if you're going to use varying effect models with multiple dimensions, and you really should because they're now a standard part of a scientific toolkit in many scientific fields, I'd say most quantitative fields, these are ordinary models. If you don't use them yourself, your colleagues are using them. And if you want to understand your colleagues' work, you need to understand these models. If you're going to use these models, you're going to have to grasp this problem of centered versus non-centered parameterizations. Even though from a mathematical perspective, they're the same model, you have to draw them differently on the paper. Okay, so at the top of this slide, I've repeated uh, uh, the sort of head part of the model. That is the outcome p sub i is a Bernoulli distributed variable with some probability p sub i. And we model that probability uh, as the log odds of some sum, sum of terms. Um, now let's think about the alphas uh, in that sum of terms uh, and what they are. Now, it's a matrix, right? In fact, uh, alpha in this model is a 7 by 4 matrix because there are 7 actors and 4 treatments. I'll say that again. Alpha in this model, as it appears in the logit P line at the top, is a 7 by 4 matrix. Uh, in each logit, uh, in each line P, uh, in each line I, we're only pulling one cell out of that matrix because we're only looking at one actor and one treatment. Uh, but it's a 7 by 4 matrix because there are 7 actors and 4 treatments. Uh, it turns out uh, we can re-express this matrix in terms of other parameters. Uh, so we can do the non-centering. Uh, and here's the equation to do it. Now this thing is monstrous, but let me walk you through it piece by piece. Um, so you understand a little bit at least of what's going on. The computer is going to do this for you. So you don't have to be comfortable doing all the multiplication and doing this by hand by any means. Uh, but it's nice to know 
uh, what's going on inside the machine. So the first thing inside this monstrous expression is a diagonal matrix of standard deviations. We take the vector of standard deviations. There's one standard deviation for every treatment. That is, how much do actors vary in treatment one? That's S sub A1. How much do actors vary uh, in treatment two? That's S sub A2. How much do actors vary in treatment three? S sub A3. And how much do actors vary in treatment four? S sub A4. And we take this vector and we string it out along the diagonal of a matrix, uh, a four by four matrix, and we fill all the other cells with zero. This is sometimes called a diagonal matrix. You take a vector and you just spread it out along the diagonal. This is a useful thing in lots of matrix algebra. And those of you who are familiar with matrix algebra have seen this before. Uh, those of you who haven't, who aren't so familiar with matrix algebra, that's fine. You don't need to understand matrix algebra to understand this lesson. Uh, matrix algebra is just a set of shortcuts for doing ordinary algebra, so you're not missing anything. This is just uh, a quick way to do lots of calculations. The next thing is we multiply this diagonal matrix by this thing called the Kolesky factor of the correlation matrix across treatments. This is something we compute from the correlation matrix across treatments. That is the thing we're trying to learn. We're trying to learn the correlation structure among the features of this cluster type, that is actors. Um, we'll talk more about this in, in a few slides. Uh, for now, just let it be a bit mystical. It's a matrix though. Um, and then finally, we have a matrix of z-scores. And these are the little zero, one distributed um, as a matrix uh, where the margins are the treatments by actor. They're in the different order uh, than alpha, the opposite order from alpha. And that's just to make the matrix multiplication work out well. Finally, there's this little T in the upper right of the whole thing after those three uh, matrices in the parentheses have been multiplied together. The result is a matrix. Um, where the, the rows are treatments and the columns are actors. And so we transpose it to flip the rows and columns so that alpha is a matrix where the rows are actors and the columns are treatments. Okay, this thing is not pleasant to look at, um, but it's expressing a, a set of basic uh, transformations, just like the ones we did in the previous lecture, to do the recentering of alpha so that we can take the standard deviations, and in this case also correlations, and multiply them by z-scores and get things back on the original scale. And all the matrix algebra in this expression is just to make it more compact, not less compact. And so it's actually less confusing this way, believe it or not. Um, in this lecture, since this is not a matrix algebra course, I'm just going to abbreviate this whole thing uh, using this notation here. I'm going to say um, let diag be an operator that takes a vector and makes a diagonal matrix. Uh, and then this is the thing that we're going to insert into our statistical models. And this is just like multiplying z-scores by a standard deviation. It's the multidimensional equivalent of multiplying z-scores by standard deviations to get back on the scale, the, the centered scale of the parameters. Okay, we need to talk about this Kolesky factor a bit more though. So, Kolesky was a man. Uh, André Louis Kolesky, uh, I'm not quite sure how to say the last name or how he would have said it. It's pretty obviously a Polish name, uh, and yet he was French and served in the French army. Um, so, uh, Kolesky, Cholesky, I think both are acceptable. Kolesky, if you want. Um, and uh, the story here is that uh, uh, Kolesky was uh, a commandant, an artillery uh, commander in during the First World War. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's a bunch of French on the screen. So uh, I took French in high school, and my French is terrible, but I'm prepared to offer you uh, my translation of the first uh, sentence of this paper. Uh, the artillery commander Kolesky of the Geographical Service of the Army killed during the Great War. Uh, he was killed in 1918. You can see in the lower right of this slide, which was the last year of World War I. Imagine during research on the compensation of the geodesic networks, a very ingenious process of solving the equations known as normal, obtained by application of the method of least squares to linear equations in lower number than that of unknowns. 
Okay, if you're like me, you recognize words in there, but you're not sure exactly what this means, uh, that's fine. Um, what uh, Commander Koleski uh, figured out during his service uh, as an artillery commander was a very general solution to systems of linear equations that can be used to do lots of clever stuff in many branches of applied mathematics. And we're going to use it here to do our non-centered distributions and then put them back on the centered scale so that we can sample efficiently from Gaussian bowls, uh, but still get the parameters we want that are not standardized. This is what it looks like in the simplest possible form. Um, so in this code block, what I've done at the top of it is I simply define some two-dimensional Gaussian distribution with a correlation of 0.6 between the two dimensions. So this is the idea that there are two dimensions and the standard deviation of the first is two, that's what sigma one means, and the standard deviation of the second is a half, and they have some correlation rho of 0.6. So that's a, that's a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. But now we're going to simulate it. Um, do a Monte Carlo simulation of that Gaussian distribution by sampling from independent standardized normal distributions. And that's what I do in the middle of this code block. Z1 and Z2 are just Z scores. Uh, R norm of n, if you, in R, if you uh, give R norm only the first argument, it assumes the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So we have uh, two vectors now of z-scores, random z-scores, that have no relationship between one another. z1 and z2 are totally independent. And now we're going to use Koleski's technique to blend the correlation back in and get the defined 2D Gaussian at the top of the code block. So we define um, the target distribution using A1 and A2. We compute A1 and in this familiar way of just multiplying the z-scores uh, by sigma 1. You've seen this in the previous lecture, uh, lecture. so this just rescales the z-scores to put them on have, so that they have the proper variance. And then here's the Koleski part. That weird expression at the, sorry, I should have highlighted that, this weird expression at the bottom, A2, uh, is the Koleski factor, uh, this thing that, that we'll talk about more in this lecture. Um, where it turns out for the bivariate case, the proper Koleski factor is this odd looking expression that we can express uh, using uh, addition and multiplication and a square root. Um, and it allows us to basically mix together the values of Z1 and Z2 for each case uh, and get the proper correlation. And so you see in the output box on the right of this slide now, if, after you run the code here, the correlation between Z1 and Z2 is effectively zero because they're independent, but the correlation between A1 and A2 is about 0.6, as it should be, and the standard deviations of A1 and A2 are also correct. Uh, and this is the Koleski magic. Okay. You're not going to have to do any of that yourself. The computer will happily do all that. It'll compute the Koleski factors for any number of dimensions, uh, and it'll do all the multiplication to get them back on the centered scale as well. Uh, and so it, the computer does these um, uh, odd diag matrix multiplication lines that you see uh, on the screen now that compute alpha and beta from their uh, corresponding non-centered pieces. Okay. The next thing we need in this model, of course, is a bit simpler than all that. It's just to express the prior distributions for the z-scores. So we have these um, z uh, uh, matrices now uh, for uh, treatments by actor and treatments by block, and we give every element uh, of these matrices a standardized normal prior distribution. No correlations among the, among the elements. The correlation matrix is going to handle that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also for the means, we give them, uh, we're going to uh, make them non-centered as well. So we give them their own uh, Z distributions. This is just like the previous lecture. Uh, there's nothing new here. It's, these are just one dimensional uh, partial pooling priors. And we assign them back uh, on their mean effects. We get alpha bar, alpha bar and beta bar back just by multiplying the Z score um, for each actor by the proper standard deviation um, for actors. This is tau sub a, and, and then for blocks, tau sub b. And then finally, uh, the priors, as we expressed them before. This is the same 
as the model in, before the break. There's nothing new here. Uh, we can still express um, um, the standard deviation priors the same way and the correlation matrix priors the same way. The only difference is um, the machine now, the golem, is going to have to take these correlation matrices and compute the proper Koleski factors, the L's. So every L, L sub A is, is uh, computed from R sub A. And so, but the machine does that for you. Um, they're just, it's just the, the code and, and it doesn't add any complexity to the expression of the code. Let's look at the code. So uh, this is long, I know. This is really staring into the eyes of an old one. Um, but let's just take it one piece at a time. You will maintain control. You will not be consumed, I promise you. Uh, so the adaptive priors, these lines that um, convert um, the uh, uh, non-centered parameters, the sigmas, the Koleski factors, and the z-scores, onto the centered scale so we can use them in the linear model. Remember the, in the linear model, we see A bar and A and B bar and B, and those are all centered parameters they come from centered distributions. They have to be computed from the non-centered distributions. So the two lines I've highlighted here do that. And you, I've already explained them on the right, um, all the matrix multiplication. And on the left in ULAM, there's a convenience function for doing this calculation. It's called compose non-centered. But all it does is the matrix multiplication and transposition that is expressed on the right. That's literally all it does. And this gives us our alpha matrix and our beta matrix, and we can use them directly in the generalized linear model. Next, these boring uh, um, uh, standardized normal prior distributions that that get plugged into those composed non-centered expressions just above. Then the um, one-dimensional partial pooling distributions and conversions for A bar and B bar. Then the fixed priors, no surprises there, I don't think. The only thing to note perhaps in the code is that um, here I've defined the priors directly on the Koleski factors. So instead of having row A, I have L row A. And instead of LKJ core, we have LKJ core Koleski. This is just a shortcut to reduce computational load. We do all the calculations using the Koleski factors directly. But really it's still just a correlation matrix. It's just something derived from a correlation matrix. And this is still the LKJ core prior distribution just as before. Finally, for convenience, um, you can't really interpret uh, Koleski factors from a correlation matrix. Uh, so you need to convert them back to a correlation matrix so you can understand the posterior correlations among the features of each cluster. And so I put this at the very bottom, uh, just a little bit of code to take the Koleski factors and, and save them as correlation matrices so that they show up in the posterior distribution, the samples that you extract after you run this model. Okay, this model samples a lot better than the previous one. No divergent transitions, and um, the chains mix much better. We get higher numbers of effective samples. The R hats are good. Uh, on the left, I'm showing you an interesting feature. There's nothing wrong with these trank plots, except you'll see for some of the elements of the Koleski factor um, parameters. Remember, a Koleski factor is a matrix, just just like the correlation matrix it's derived from. But some of the elements are invariant because uh, a Koleski factor is a diagonal matrix. That is, uh, either the upper or lower diagonal is, is filled with zeros. Uh, and that's what you see here for some of the elements of any Koleski factor. When you run one of these models, um, it's going to be invariant. And so the number of effective samples is going to be NAN, which is not a number because you can't compute effective samples for something that doesn't vary. Um, it's effectively uh, uh, zero, I guess. Um, this, this is not a problem, and that's why I show it to you. That nothing's gone wrong. Uh, it's just that these are returned in the output, uh, but they're not really free parameters that have been estimated. They're just, they're just products of the Koleski calculation. Um, the important lesson here is to look on the right. Uh, again, uh, I showed you something like this in the previous lecture when I compared the centered model to the non-centered model. I'm doing that again now for this example with many more dimensions, the fully flexible chimpanzees and uh, multi-dimensional chimpanzees. 
And again, you see that the non-centered model on the vertical axis um, nearly always, except for two parameters there shown in red, has more has a larger effective sample size for each parameter than the centered model on the horizontal. That's true of this example. There are other examples where the opposite might be true. So again, it's, it's not that the non-centered version is always better. Um, sometimes the centered version is better, uh, but it's much easier to express the centered version. And that's why I'm teaching the non-centered version so explicitly. Uh, you would never teach the non-centered version first because it's such a non-obvious way to code the model. Uh, so if you start off um, with some intuition about which is better, that's great. Uh, but being able to convert between the two uh, for each type of cluster, because sometimes one cluster needs a centered uh, expression and sometimes uh, some other cluster in the same model needs a non-centered parameterization. Uh, that comfort in switching between them is a real essential part of being able to draw these owls. Uh, it'll make you uh, much more powerful and much more sure of your results, and that in turn will give your colleagues much more confidence in your results. Okay, after all this work, it'd be nice to see what the results are, wouldn't it? So let's take a look. What I'm plotting out on this slide are the posterior distributions of all of these varying effects on the left the actor treatment effects in blue, and on the right, the block treatment effects in red. So for the actor treatment effects, the way to interpret this is each cluster is an actor, uh, labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven for each of the seven chimpanzees. And then in each cluster, the treatments are ordered from left to right, one, two, three, four. So what you can see is the same pattern as in the previous lecture. The actors vary a lot in their handedness preferences. There's number two who always pulls the left lever in every treatment plastered up against uh, the top of the vertical axis. And the other individuals seem to respond a bit to the treatment when the prosocial options on the left, that is in treatments two and four, the, the second and the last. Uh, but most of the variation you can see from just looking is between actors, not between treatments. And then on the right, for the block effects, the block treatment effects rather, it's the same patterning. Each cluster is a block now, labeled one, two, three, four, five, and six. And again, the treatments are ordered from left to right, one, two, three, four. It's a different pattern now in that the blocks aren't very different. So most of the variation here is actually within each block. That is, the treatments do differ, especially within block six, you'll see. Uh, and the blocks are basically all the same. We can verify this by looking at the standard deviation estimates from the model. Remember, it's a varying effects model. So if we want to make assessments about these variances and whether they're more within or between the clusters, we can just inspect the posterior distributions of the variance components of the sigmas. So in this case, I've augmented this graph to show them at the bottom. On the left, bottom left, we have the uh, posterior distributions of the variance components for the actors. So in blue, we have the density we saw last time. These are the, this is the posterior distribution of the standard deviation um, uh, among actor means, that is the averages among actors. So this is an assessment of the variation across actors on average and how they act. And then the purple densities, there are four of them there labeled over one another, uh, are the by treatment effects. And you'll see that those are much smaller. Uh, and this reflects what you see in the graph just above it. Most of the variation is between actors and not within actors across treatments. The actors aren't responding much to treatments. On the right, we have a reversal of this pattern. Well, it's not a very strong reversal, but nevertheless, it is a reversal. Uh, the, the red in the lower right is the density we saw before. There's not a lot of variation among blocks, and so the posterior distribution of the standard deviation across blocks, that is how, how different blocks are on average, uh, is quite small. And then in purple, again, there are four densities layered over one another, are the by treatment effects. This, each of these assesses uh, within each block, how much variation there is across treatments. And this is a bit larger. Again, there's not a lot of variation either within or across blocks. The total variation 
uh, explained by block is small in this experiment. Uh, but to the extent that there is variation by block, it's within block across treatments and not between them. If you wanted to hold out some hope that the chimpanzees were, were starting to behave in this experiment in a way similar to how human kids behave, uh, then you could pick it up from block six there where the uh, treatment effects appear to be stronger. However, they're just responding more strongly to the prosocial option being on the left in block six. They're still not responding to the presence or absence of a partner anymore. Okay, let me sum up. Uh, this has been a um, lecture on correlated varying effects. It's just an introduction. To really get a grasp on this material, you have to practice with these models and use them and make some mistakes and recover. You have to draw the owl. Uh, so if you're feeling a bit um, like there are parts of this you haven't understood yet, that's normal. That's how it's supposed to be. That only means you're paying attention. As always, if you're feeling confused, it's because you're paying attention, and I congratulate you and thank you for that. Uh, so let me remind you what I tried to get across in outline form, uh, and then you can review the lecture again, uh, perhaps at double speed, and pick up the bits again uh, that you need to. Uh, the first is that for varying effects models, uh, they tend to work better if we use priors that also learn correlation structure, not just the variation across the clusters. So remember, the, the varying effects strategy is that if we learn the prior's variance from the data, then we make better estimates. Well, the same extends in multiple dimensions to also learning the correlations. If we learn the correlations across the features across the clusters, or the correlations, uh, so there are features within each cluster. Uh, if we learn the correlations within each cluster of those feature values, then we can also make even better uh, estimates. Uh, and this allows us to have partial pooling across the features. And that's what I showed you in the department example in the first part of this lecture, where the model effectively anticipates before it's seen the applications from women, uh, where the average will be. And it anticipates it from the population correlation between the two parameter types. The second thing we get from priors that learn correlation structure is that it allows us to exploit those correlations for predictions. Now, when we want to make predictions of various kinds, our predictions can be better because not only do we know there's variation in the population, but that, that variation will have some structure. And that structure can be very important for predicting new clusters, the ones that we haven't observed in the data. This is equally important for causal inference, which is, as I keep saying, a special kind of prediction where we try to predict the consequences of an intervention. Um, or to explain the results of something, thinking about it the other way. And these correlations can be important for that as well. Because remember, varying effects are a kind of unobserved confound, um, and getting good estimates for them can help us get some control on those confounds. Okay, one note uh, uh, before I end. If you do these models without the correlation structure, so you can back up in this lecture, and take the correlation matrices out and express all of the priors in the, in the previous model um, in terms of one very uh, one dimensional uh, Gaussian distributions with their own standard deviations. That is each treatment would have its own standard deviation. Uh, that model would run fine. It would make very similar predictions. And the varying effects in the posterior uh, would tend to have the, a similar correlation structure. Not exactly the same, but a similar correlation structure um, to the posterior distribution from the models that actually learn correlations. Uh, another way to say this, if I can make it simple, is that priors are just priors. So these models have priors with correlation structure in them, and that allows the model to learn the correlation structure across the clusters. But uh, a model without learning of correlation structure can still have correlated varying effects in the posterior distribution because just because the prior has no correlations that does not mean the posterior won't i'll say that again just because the prior doesn't have correlations that doesn't mean the posterior won't an absence of correlation in a prior is not a claim that correlation is impossible and as always the posterior distribution 
is free to go where the data makes it go. Uh, that's true for all Bayesian models, uh, unless your priors constrain the outcome space, of course. Um, so that means uh, there are going to be many applied contexts in which all the complexity in this lecture doesn't help you very much and is unnecessary. You can get away with treating all your varying effects as one-dimensional, uh, ignoring correlation matrices and Koleski factors and all of this uh, eldritch monstrosity that I've done in the last hour or so. And I can sympathize with the desire to do that. Um, however, uh, science is a profession and we have an ethical obligation to do our best. So if you know how to do better, you should be willing to do the little bit of work extra to do better so that you can defend your results as saying that you did the best thing you knew how to do, not that you thought the best thing would be too hard and so you compromised. Okay, that has been lecture 14 and this is week seven. Uh, next week of Statistical Rethinking 2022, we're gonna do more multi-level models, yet more. But I promise we're going to turn more to applications now. And I'm going to look at custom kinds of multi-level models that are useful for doing things like social network analysis and phylogenetic analysis. And then we're also going to look at a funny sort of multi-level model known as a Gaussian process, which is extremely useful and very broad family of methods. And I'll see you there. <laughs>